Hey everybody, it's Dr. Joe <clears throat> back in town. Hope all is well. And uh, you're having a good time. So last uh, Wednesday was Valentine's Day. And I hope you had a great Valentine's. Uh, feel free to share your experiences. I had a great time on my side. And, uh, and so we're back to the real world. In fact, next week, uh, I'm going on a cruise. I'm going off to the Caribbean. Uh, my first uh, uh, overseas trip, my first vacation this year, 2024. My goal, as usual, is to do at least three countries and uh, and so on. So off to uh, Bahamas, Jamaica, Cayman Islands, took some Caicos from Florida. So anyway, with that said and done, let's talk about uh, this week's Wealth Wednesday. And we're going to talk about mastering the art of landlording from screening to evictions. We're going to have a real good session today, I think. And uh, And so, as you know, uh, if you're going to be, um, you know, doing this business, buy and hold, which is what I do, uh, at some point you're going to have to have tenants. And uh, the key to your survival as a landlord or as a property manager is your ability to screen and manage the relationship with your tenants and hopefully avoid evictions because evictions are very, very uh, painful, uh, expensive and frustrating experiences. Uh, I haven't done an eviction for at least my, probably getting on to 70, like 10 years maybe. Um, and um, and so uh, hopefully with some of the, uh, you know, the mentions, uh, discussions that we'll be having today, it'll help you so you can avoid evictions and hopefully you'll be a, pro a, a, a better property manager, a better landlord, and so on. So mastering the art of landlording from screening to eviction. We're going to go through the whole life cycle as a property manager, as a landlord. Okay. So uh, as you know, uh, being a landlord is not easy. Uh, it's scary. A lot of people are frightened by the whole idea of tenants, screening tenants, managing tenants, dealing with tenants, tenants and toilets, uh, all that stuff, uh, especially section eight. Then you put on top of that, the you know the whole stereotype associated with section eight tenants, uh, section eight section eight bureaucracies, and uh, and so on. So if you're gonna uh, you know go down that path, then there's a lot that you need to put in place. Uh, you can definitely go through it. It's definitely it's manageable. It's definitely attainable. And uh, and I think I'm the proving point uh, to 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 talk about. So I've been doing this about 35 years. So obviously there's a lot I can share with you. But we have only an hour, so there's always so much we can cover. But uh, let's just suffice to say that it, it can be a complicated topic, and uh, especially the topic of evictions, because evictions are usually more local-based. It could be a state level, city level, county level. There may be rules and regulations that you have to adhere to. Uh, but generally, uh, they're all essentially the same. Uh, at a high level, uh, you have a relationship with your tenant and a landlord, and uh, typically the tenant has failed to perform on the lease. And as a result of that, you have, uh, you know, you have the right to exercise the terms of the agreement that they've broken. And typically you have to give some kind of notice to the tenant, let them know that, uh, you know, there's a, an issue that's uh, occurred, which is breaking the agreement. And uh, once you provide some level of notice based on your jurisdiction where you are, then typically you have to go through the judicial process and make your case to the judge. And ultimately a judge will decide whether to side with you or the tenant and, uh, and so on. So we're going to cover some of that stuff today. So, um, so let's go to, uh, you know, number one, which really is the, the, the key to this thing, which is tenant screening. Uh, and then the issue is what are the keys to finding the right tenant? What is the right tenant? You know, I mean, uh, I know what's the right tenant for me, uh, to me, the right tenant is someone that's going to take care of my property, uh, pleasant to deal with. Um, you know, they pay their rent and just have a pleasant demeanor. Uh, that's what I'm looking for uh, when I screen for tenants. And uh, at a high level, it sounds pretty straightforward. But there's a lot of people that don't meet that criteria. In fact, we're going through that process right now with two of my students. Uh, and uh, I'm helping them um you know screen and select tenants and uh and so on so it's been very um uh, a great experience so far helping them showing them what i do um you know in fact today we went to uh 
a home visit uh, with a prospective tenant and went to the home and see how they keep the home and very insightful. And I don't understand why people don't do home visits. To me, it's absolutely key. Uh, but that's another topic. But we know, but it the whole idea is if you have the wrong person in your house, it is not fun. Uh it's 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 horrible. Um, you know, um problem tenants who don't pay you, professional tenants who know the laws better than you do. Uh, people that will, uh, you know, trash your house, uh, nonstop drama. I mean, they're out there and your job is to avoid them. And you can do that through screening. And so to answer your question, what's the right, uh, the key, it, it, you know, in my opinion, anyway, 80% of all your problems as a landlord, as a owner, is because you just got the wrong person in your house. That's it. Most of your problems is that you just got the wrong person in your house as they somehow got through your screening process, <clears throat> if you have a screening process, and now they're making your life hell. So the cornerstone to your uh, sanity uh, as a landlord, as a uh, an investor, buy and hold investor, is the caliber of the tenants uh, that you welcome <clears throat> to your properties, and uh, you know, and so on. So, and it's not just while well, they can pay the rent, they got money. And therefore, they're good tenants. No, not necessarily. You can have great people. You can have people who got the money, but they're just a, a, a nightmare to deal with. Uh, you know, the right people, in my opinion, they're reliable. They they do what they say they're going to do. They respect your property, and uh, they have uh, they're able to have a harmonious relationship uh, with you, uh, with the neighbors. And uh, they adhere to the terms of your, um, you know, your policies. So that's to me is uh, an idea, the right tenant. <clears throat> but to get that, it means that your screening process has to be meticulous. It has to be detailed. Uh, you can't just go by gut feelings and uh, and things like that. Um, you know, you do the usual stuff, background checks. What does that mean? You're going to go through, uh, look at their history either in paying rent, uh, their history in terms of their relationships with landlords, their previous landlords, their history in terms of, uh, <clears throat> you know, activities. Because everybody has a history. And your job as a prospective landlord is to understand that history and therefore make calculated decisions, okay? And, uh, yeah, to a certain extent, there's some gut to it. Uh, but I don't believe in just gut. Uh, feelings. I think I believe in detail and uh, data, uh, thorough review, thorough check-in, and uh, and so on. So that's what's important to me. So what does that mean? It means that you have to engage when you meet with tenants on conversations. Uh, I'm not a great believer in some of these uh, new programs out here where, uh, you know, essentially somebody who's interested in your house, they go on some website, they plug in their name, address, uh, and the system does some kind of, through the algorithms, determines whether you should rent to them or not. Um, you know, I, I don't believe in that. I don't do that. I don't understand why people do that. Um, you know, I'm not going to allow a 300, 400, 500, 800 million dollar home uh, and who I decide to rent uh, or live there to be determined by some algorithm. Uh, I want to have direct conversation with my prospective tenant. I want to know who they are. I want to be able to ask them pointed questions uh, and their expectations, make sure there's a win-win for both of us, for me as the owner and them as a prospective customer of mine. I want to make sure it's the right uh, choice. I want to make sure I set the expectations from the go. And uh, you can really do that by having direct conversations. I mean, yesterday we... Uh, I was helping a student and uh, got a couple of applications. Uh, I sat down, talked to the prospective, must be what, 20, 25 minutes, just going through the application form, uh, asking them questions, uh, you know, listening out for certain things on their responses, all those things we were doing yesterday. And um, then, so it's direct conversations, what I call check-in references, current landlords, previous landlords, people have lied to me about their 
uh, landlord, um, you know, who their landlord is or isn't. Uh, it turns out to be some people, it's, it's a buddy of theirs. Um, you know, some people, they give names that aren't the real owners. And, uh, yeah, we had that this week. So, you know, it's checking references meticulously. And uh, obviously, you want to adhere to um, fair housing laws. You don't want to discriminate based on, you know, the protected classes. But I think it's fair that uh, you have some criteria to decide on whether to select somebody. And those policies, I call them, should be applied across the board to everybody. Okay, these are really, really critical steps, you know, and, um, you know, it, it, it's important because you want to make sure anyway, if you're going to do this, that you avoid any discrimination claims and uh, you want to make sure you interpret data correctly and you want to make sure that you select right and you, you know, navigate privacy concerns that people may have. So, um, you know, in my opinion, screening is the absolute key. And I could spend a whole day on this one. And what do you do? Go through the intricacies. And uh, my thing is this, and I'll give you a little nugget. I start off with the product. If you have a great, I start, well, I start off by trying to clearly define the type of tenant that I'm looking for. Who is my ideal tenant? What are their character characteristics? What are they looking for? Where do they want to live? Where do they not want to live? Where, who do they want to rent from? Who do they not want to? I mean, I start from there. I focus on my customer, uh, my tenants, prospective tenants, and start from there. And then I work backwards. Who's my ideal tenant? What are these people looking for? I make sure that I have a product uh, that meets their needs. And then uh, I then start asking questions and uh, screening with that in mind. And um, I have a great product in a great neighborhood usually, and therefore I'm able to attract quality tenants who want my house and therefore are able to, or willing to put up with my thorough screening, put up with my questions because they want, I've got something that they want. And, uh, you know, and so I can raise the bar in terms of the screening standards and they'll be okay with it. Okay, so screen is the key. And uh, maybe we'll do another session just on screening. Uh, but I've got uh, about five other things which I want to cover uh, as, as uh, you know, as part of today's live stream. But the, the more important thing to remember is that a mistake here in screening will is a disaster. And, uh, and you don't want to do that and, and so on. OK, so what are some of the action items that you may want to consider? Uh, you know, as it pertains to uh, screening, let's see if I can put that up. Uh, you know, develop a comprehensive, what I call a tenant screening checklist. What are the criteria you're going to use? What's the criteria that's important for you? Level uh, leverage uh, technology. There's a lot of tools out there uh, that can help you in terms of background and credit checks and uh, criminal checks and uh, and so on. Uh, engage in meaningful conversation with prospective uh, tenants. Don't just rely on the algorithms to tell you who to rent to or not. And also, obviously, uh, always adhere to fair housing laws and make sure you're compliant with those things and you're fair. Okay. So the second topic we're going to cover uh, today is what I call lease management. How can you ensure compliance and minimize uh, risks? OK, uh, so at this point, you know, you've selected somebody and uh, most of the time you should have a lease, a rental agreement that clearly defines and states what it is that's important uh, for you. That's going to be in your document. So, uh, you know, it's really important to have a solid lease. My lease is 20 pages. Uh, it's very detailed, um, you know, but obviously when you have a lease, you got it's a kind of a, a delicate balance between uh, you know what your needs are and what's fair to uh, you know the prospective tenants. Uh, it's a legal document, so it has to be comprehensive and it covers all many, many topics like rent payments, uh, maintenance, responsibilities, uh, and also address unforeseen uh, circumstances. For example, I think um, I believe it or not one, Many years ago, somebody had a cookout in one of my houses inside the house. OK. And, you know, obviously most people with common sense aren't going to do that. But this tenant decided to have a cookout. So 
uh, you know, fire alarm was blowing all over the place. Uh, smoke detectors was going off, and she called me and said, "Hey, I don't understand what's going on. The smoke detectors are going off." And I said, "Well, you know, what are you doing?" And she said, "Well, we're just having a cookout." You know, I mean, it's, it sounds crazy. Uh, so obviously, in my lease now, you can't have a cookout in the house. That's the lease violation. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of situations I've been through, and when I go through those experiences, we just update the lease to uh to cover those things uh so lease management becomes very important you obviously want to enforce the terms of your lease uh you want to explain to the tenant uh what are the key things that's important for you and make sure that uh, they clearly understand uh if there's violations of the lease obviously you want to make sure you have things in place to address that and i think that as the laws changes uh as situations occur then you want to update the lease and uh, make changes as and when you see deemed fit. Uh, you know, communication is always key, obviously. You want to be able to uh, communicate with your tenants what's important for you. You want to, uh, if necessary, negotiate. Because sometimes, you know, they may, uh, let's say, for instance, your lease has no pets and they bring in a dog or a pet. I mean, that's, a, that's on your call now, whether you want to enforce that uh violation by taking them to court or working out some kind of compromise maybe uh if the animal is a good animal and they can take care of it maybe you put a, a pet agreement with a pet deposit and, and things like that so these are negotiations that you can sort of discuss with your tenants and uh and so on but the important thing is that your lease should be clear it should be detailed and so that way it prevents disputes. It can sort of, uh, you know, and you want to kind of avoid vague terms and uh, especially vague terms that lead to conflicts, misunderstanding. And as I said before, I, re I recommend that you review your lease every now and then, maybe once a year and, uh, and keep in touch with local laws and the change that's been applied there and be proactive in updating your lease accordingly. So uh, the key is to be flexible as necessary and ensure that uh, you have policies in place to enforce and maintain the lease terms. And uh, you got to do what you got to do in the event that the, the tenant decides they want to, uh, you know, not adhere to some of your lease terms. So what are some of the action items you may want to consider? Uh, ensure the lease agreement that you have is clear. Uh, you know, it's clear, detailed and legally compliant with your local, uh, either state, local or federal level. Uh, conduct regular, regular lease reviews uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, your your lease is uh, is good one. And uh, engage in open communication with tenants. And so that way they understand exactly what uh, their rights are and what their obligations are. And uh, there's some software nowadays, lease management software that you can use to keep track and update your documents on a regular basis. So that's number two. Number three in today's topic is handling evictions, evictions. Uh, hopefully you don't have to go through evictions. Uh, I haven't been through one, as I said before, for a number of years now, thank God. Uh, but, uh, you know, you want to avoid evictions if you can. It's very, very expensive. It's a very frustrating experience. And uh, there are really no, no winners uh, out of an eviction. So it's very challenging. Uh, and it's, it's a legal process. So you don't want to do what we call self-help inspection uh, in evictions, where you literally throw people out, change the locks, cut off the utilities just to try and drive them out. You don't want to do that. Uh, you can get in trouble for that. Uh, but there are things that you can do to minimize, uh, even prevent evictions uh, through documentation and uh, a solid understanding of your legal uh, you know, process procedures. So if you've got properties in the, in jurisdiction A, I think it's a good idea to understand what the eviction process is in uh, area A, because it could be different in area B, C, D, and so forth. So uh, I think you need to understand what the process is for evicting. Some places it's pretty straightforward, um, and some places it's quite complicated. In Washington, D.C., for example, it's quite complicated. Um, there's a lot of rules uh, in terms of do's and don'ts that you have to adhere to. You have to have a license, for example, uh, even to evict anybody, even to start the process off. 
you got to put your license information onto the eviction forms or the court forms, which means that if you don't have a license, you can't even start the process. So if you didn't know that, uh, you know, it's not good. So understand what the process is where you are and make sure that, uh, you know, and you want to do that before, uh, you know, you have a bad tenant. So you want to kind of go to the landlord tenant court as well, sit in the back, observe, you know, what's going on, learn from other uh, other landlords uh, experiences landlords mistakes so hopefully you can avoid making those things yourself but uh it, it, it you know but the the whole idea is to prevent if you can through documentation and a, a really understanding of the uh, of the process and act decisively if you have to do it don't drag it out just do what you got to do and let the chips fall where they fall but you have to make sure that you adhere to the um, you know the laws in your locality and um you know so but again you make sure that you explain the lease terms to the tenant especially during the you know the move-in process and also under, explain to them what the consequences of uh violation of your terms and uh and you have to consistently enforce the rules especially if you're in a multi multi-family building where you may enforce it to one person but not to somebody else and that can create problems and uh and so on so uh the important thing is that uh seek legal advice if you're not comfortable some places you can do it yourself some places not a good idea and uh and just understand the process from start to finish and the paperwork the notice requirements and the steps involved in that process so what are some of the action items in terms of evictions that you may want to consider doing um maintain meticulous records because obviously if you're going in front of a judge you want to have your documentation in order. Uh, understand and follow the lease, uh, the you know the legal eviction process. Don't do anything self-help or do anything outside of the legal uh, things. Uh, sometimes it's better just to uh, employ a mediator. Uh, it's cheaper, and uh, normally you can get it done a lot faster than going through the entire court process from start to finish. And obviously, you want to consult with legal professionals uh specialize in, in landlord tenant laws that's things that you can do right now as action items a number of uh so again we're gonna have to uh have a q a in about another 15 10 15 minutes so if you've got some questions you want to post to me start putting them up in your in the chat box and uh, we'll do the ask dr joe very shortly anything to do real estate investing landlord tenant financing acquisition renovations all that stuff anything to do real estate put them in your chat box and I will get to in about 10 minutes from now in the Ask Dr. Joe segment. So let's go to number four, um, maintenance and repairs. This is another thing that you got to consider as a landlord. If things go wrong with the house, things go wrong with the systems, and you got to have some me me method and mechanisms to deal with that. You know, so the question becomes, how do you balance the costs uh, associated with making repairs with uh making sure the tenants are happy by fixing stuff uh one of the ways to really upset a tenant is to avoid them ignore them especially when they have complaints about stuff that needs to get repaired so be proactive uh and timely on your repairs uh you know it's it's in your interest to do that legally and uh also in terms of tenant satisfaction if the tenants know that you're taking care of stuff they're more likely to uh, give you a break. If you ignore them or blow them off because you know, you're know you not really interested in fixing stuff or not interested in communicating with them, it could be very, very prob problematic. So really I found at least successful landlords, you know, uh, I see uh, maintenance and repairs are, are at two levels. It's, uh, it's proactive in preventing issues. And uh, also, it lets them know I'm, I take their concerns seriously if something goes wrong. So I have systems in place. If A goes wrong, B goes wrong, what do I do? Uh, I have the right people. I have the home warranties in place. I have the handyman in place such that we can turn these stuff uh, around quickly. Obviously, it's going to cost, which means that you need to have a reserve fund or have some money set aside for repairs. It is what it is and uh things go wrong um i mean like today yeah today is a good one i know yesterday uh one of my properties the ac is gone uh so i called the home warranty company 
and they sent somebody out and uh you know unfortunately the the whole furnace has to be replaced very very expensive fortunately i have a home warranty and uh, they're going to cover the cost of replacing the furnace which is quite an expensive item and uh and so on so if i have a tenant who's upset because they have no heat i let them know i'm working on it and uh and that usually buys me some time so again it's proactive it's uh you know i understand that if i want to have high customer satisfaction one of the things that's really important to tenants is your ability to respond to be responsive and also take care of repairs uh as and when they occur so the real challenge for you is going to be prioritizing your repairs and maintenance tasks because you can you know do you want to be proactive or do you want to be reactive uh choosing the right people the right contractors such that if a goes wrong you know you got people in place to take care of those things and obviously you want to manage costs without compromising quality so uh you know uh i develop a i've developed a, a a network of reliable contractors who i can call on and service providers i can call on when necessary and uh it's really really helpful because i can be very pro proactive and very responsive uh when stuff happens and stuff does happen so what are some of the action items associated with maintenance and repair uh set up a dedicated maintenance reserve fund set aside some money for that uh, prioritize, uh, you know, repairs based on urgency. Certain things need to be done quickly. Other things, uh, it doesn't matter if it's a day or two. Uh, build a network of reliable contractors and service providers and also conduct regular uh, property uh, inspections of your, uh, and to, to be pre, pre so you can preempt uh, some of the maintenance issues that you otherwise would face. Uh, number five, I've uh, got a couple more left. Uh, rent collection, that's another good one. Uh, how can you streamline this process to ensure timely payments? Obviously, you want your payments on time. And one thing I do, as you know, I do Section 8. And uh, that rent is guaranteed. It's going to hit my account every month by the second or third of the month. Guaranteed. Uh, it's uh, very, very reliable. It's very streamlined. Where 70 to 80% of my money hits my account without me doing anything. Uh, so efficient rent collection uh, is pivotal, really, to maintaining your cash flow and also reducing, uh, you know, uh, associated costs. So the goal is to make it convenient as possible for your tenants. OK, so that way uh, it makes it easier for them to pay you. And uh, it's a reliable uh, payment uh, method. Uh, I know for me, everything, all my tenants pay electronically uh, through things like Cash App, Venmo, Zelle um uh, you know and so on uh it's all online it's all electronic so there's a paper trail uh i don't allow them to mail me money i don't knock on doors to collect rent i don't do that anymore i used to at one time i don't do it anymore but the idea is to make it as easy as possible for the tenants so they can pay you without a whole lot of drama and so you have clear policies uh on things like late payments uh you want to communicate those things up front and you want to enforce it consistently. And uh, but the important thing is to set uh, clear expectations. What are you expecting from them in terms of rent? Uh, when is rent due? What are the late charges going to uh, they're going to incur uh, if the rent is late? And you have to enforce those things right from the get go. Uh, you know there are programs out here where you can have automated reminders. There's software out here that can streamline this entire process for you. But the important thing is that you've got to make it easy for your tenants to pay, uh, pay you your rent. So what are some of the action items uh, in terms of rent collection? Uh, clearly outline your rent uh, collection policies in your lease. Uh, you want to offer a variety of payment options for your tenants uh, to accommodate their preferences. Uh, you want to implement, uh, as if possible anyway, automated uh, payment uh, reminders. And uh, also you want to enforce late payment uh, you know, fees and charges consistently across the board. And finally, number six, building a, pos a positive landlord-tenant relationship. Why is this critical and how can it be achieved? It's absolutely critical that you have positive relationship with your tenants. They are your customers. If you don't have a good relationship with your 
tenants and it turns adversarial it's 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 not good uh so uh, how do you do this um you know uh, my key is that i want to minimize turnover i don't want people to leave once they come into my house uh, a good relationship with your tenants uh creates a firewall it generates a lot of goodwill and uh you know and they know who they're dealing with and so it's uh it's it's a way where you can get mutual respect and uh the key to having happy tenants long-term tenants is being responsive to tenant needs uh clear communications and also respect for tenants privacy don't just show up at their houses whenever you feel like it and things like that regular updates is really important um you know and uh I like to do small gestures, just let tenants know I appreciate them. You know what I do, Mother's Day gifts, birthday cards, free vacations. These are gestures. It doesn't cost much, but it, uh, it has a, a high impact uh, from a tenant perspective. And uh, it differentiates me from other landlords that are out there trying to poach these tenants. Uh, so that's uh, landlord in and building positive relationship and the action items from there. Be transparent, have regular communication with your tenants, show responsiveness to maintenance uh, requests and concerns, offer fle flexibility in terms of uh, you know, communications, and just have a good customer service policy and just have a, cust a good customer service mindset. And so we'll wrap it up by saying, in conclusion, you know, the art of landlording is uh, it's, it's not complicated. It's not easy, as you can see. There's a lot of um you know facets to this and uh it's you know legal things issues you got interpersonal issues you got to deal with inter interpersonal skills and to a certain extent you have a strategy and foresight and uh so hopefully i shared with you in this live stream some ideas some tips that you may want to consider as you move forward and hopefully today was helpful in preparing you to have good quality great tenants and keeping those tenants once they're in your home uh it's definitely doable i do it my longest tenant is 20 is now 27 years 27 years is my longest tenant and i have 18 year tenants 20 year tenants 22 year tenants 15 year tenants that is not by accident that is by a calculated strategy focused on customer service it's focused on the fact that i don't want turnover and uh and i try to uh promote good quality relationships with my tenants so hopefully today was good hopefully this will help you on your journey and we're going to go to uh q a in a second again if you've got any questions put your questions in the chat chat box and uh if you've got an email if you want to communicate with me you can always shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com and uh also uh you know if you have uh some questions you want to you know speak with me meet with me one-on-one -on -one, which is specific to your situation i do now have the opportunities to uh to do one-on-ones uh you can schedule go to my website joe at joeasimo.com it's the ask dr joe uh link on the website just sign up for a, a one hour one-on-one -on -one consult there is a fee for that it's not free it's just full disclosure it's 175 dollars for one hour but to me it is money well spent. I just had one this morning uh, with a customer. We had a great time. Uh, I think I've helped them so much, so, so, so much. I think it's the third uh, consultant we've had. But their, you know, their level of confidence has increased dramatically just by the communications we have, the meetings that we have, the tips I can share with them, the do's and don'ts. So if you've got any issues pertaining to real estate acquisition, uh, renovations, property management, tenant selections, section eight, doesn't matter. Uh, feel free to book a one-on-one -on -one with me and I'll be more than happy to, uh, to discuss that. I will be off out of, out of the country on Saturday, Sunday, Sunday for one week. So next Sunday, I, next Wednesday, I will not be doing a wealth Wednesday because I'll be in the Caribbean somewhere. And, uh, so we'll probably have a, one of the recorded sessions. I'm looking forward to this break uh so far i think this year we're going to go off to kenya tanzania uganda ghana i may go to europe maybe go to london um definitely go to ghana ghana so we're mapping out our 2020 2024 
vacation schedule. Uh, I think I'll do more than three. I may do five or six this year. So we'll see. But anyway, it's all good. Hopefully today was helpful. And again, if you're going to spend one one on one time with me, just uh, go to uh, you know joesmoa.com and uh, and so on. So let's go down to the questions and chat box. And again, if you got any questions, if you want to, uh, please put them in the chat box, and I'll do what I can to uh, read them out. Okay, the first one is. Rodney, Rodney Gregory. Hi, Rodney. Hope you're doing well. Dr. Joe, good evening, sir. My name is Rodney, and I'm in a new real estate investor in the DMV. Welcome. I recently watched one of your shows on Bigger Pockets, and it was one of the best I've ever seen. Thank you. I'm interested in getting into real estate investing and will greatly appreciate your guidance as a seasoned investor. I would be honored to meet or chat with you if you're available. Thank you in advance for consideration. No problem, Rodney. Uh, shoot me an email. At Joe at joeasimo.com. And uh, so I'll put, uh, put it on the screen. You can shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com. I'm not the greatest at responding, but uh, shoot me an email and I'll do what I can. Uh, maybe we can do a quick uh, call. Um, you know, I, I, we're going to do events. Uh, Femi, let me give a, a shout out to Femi. Uh, you know, he bought a house uh, several months ago. I'm um, helping him through that. And uh, we finished the renovations. It's a beautiful house, beautiful house, six bedrooms, four bath. And this week we started the, we transitioned to the marketing and selection process. So we put an ad in various platforms. And we, he's, it's a six bedroom house and he's got several applications and uh, we feel pretty good. We've got some really solid applications and uh, some quality tier one tenants have applied for this house. And that's what I'm saying. There's a way to do this. And uh, I think we figured it out. And uh, he's got some really good, good potential candidates. And uh, I think that by the end of the weekend, we'll, we should be able to select somebody. We will be doing a, uh, an open house, uh, a networking education session at his house uh, in Washington, D.C. Probably going to be sometime in uh, early March. Uh, after I come back. So if you're going to be in the DC area, please come along and uh, you'll learn from him. Uh, you'll see one of the properties that uh, he's done in real time. And also it's a good place to educate, learn, and also to network with like-minded people. So this is what I do. I really do enjoy helping people replicate what I do. And so kudos to Femi on a fantastic uh, he's got a beautiful house, beautiful, very, very impressive. And uh, and I feel good that uh, he's on the right track. And uh, hopefully by this time next week, we'd have uh, got a, a tenant lined up at $6,300 a month rent, $6,300. Can you believe that? We've got multiple applications at $6,000 a month. It's doable. And uh, this is what I can do to help you guys out. So going back to the uh, your question again, uh, uh, Rodney, yeah, shoot me an email if I can help you out, no problem. Uh, but tune in to every Wednesday, at, uh, what's it called, Wealth Wednesday. Uh, my goal is to provide quality information, not just nonsense, quality information that's actionable and hopefully will help you uh, achieve financial independence through real estate investing. I do have a JV Wealth Builders program. I'm not trying to peddle that here or sell it here. But uh, but there's lots of different ways I can help you out, uh, Rodney. So uh, reach out to me, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, intellectual conversation with BJ. Hi, Dr. Joe Darling from D.C. How are you doing, BJ? Hope you're doing well. And let's have a look. As a landlord, if I breached the rapid if I breach the rapid rehousing contract, do I get a chance to cure the breach, or Will I be kicked off the program? Oh, my goodness. What have you done, BJ? Uh, for those people who are not sure, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, rapid Rehousing is a program whereby, uh, you know, it's almost like a Section 8, but it's more of a short-term rental program where the government assists the tenants with uh, rent in exchange for, um, you know, accommodation. So, uh, 
yeah, so I don't know what you've done to breach this rapid re. You're going to have to clarify that. Uh, if, hopefully, it's nothing bad that you've done. Uh, but yeah, if you've if you've breached the contract, uh, yeah, normally depending on what it is, you they sometimes give you a chance to cure the breach. Uh, again, it depends on what it is. I, I'm going to need to. You're going to need to clarify that, uh, BJ. Uh, you know, if it's minor, you know, I don't know. Uh, for example, you didn't change the ten, uh, the you know the, the utilities to the tenant's name. That's one thing. But if it's major, like uh, you're collecting money from the tenant, uh, which you shouldn't be doing, then yeah, uh, that's a violation. You could get into a lot of trouble. So it just depends on what the nature of the problem is. Uh, hopefully, it's not minor. It's not major. So you should have the opportunity to cure it before they uh, kick you off the program uh and so on sorry about that okay let's have a look uh so yeah so you can't you may be depending on the nature you you may be able to uh, address the issue uh before you are kicked off the program tai uh how do you deal with tenant conflicts domestic abuse or safety issues flooding fire etc in your home my goodness okay let's have a look how do i deal with tenant conflicts uh i deal with tenant conflicts by having conversations with my tenants uh, on a regular basis, and uh, if possible, I, I, I deal with tenant conflicts by, uh, you know, um, being a good landlord, being a good person. And uh, for example, uh, I think I said that earlier on today. One of my houses, there's no heat. Okay, or the the you know, and if I had an adversarial relationship with the tenant, uh, they could use that against me. They could call the city on me. Uh, they could be causing a lot of problems because they have no heat and it's cold over here. Uh, but because I, you know, I, I, I you know, I uh, value communications. And I have home warranties. Uh, when something goes wrong, like no heat, I let the tenant know I'm calling the home warranty company. They assign it to a, a licensed, bonded, insured heating company. They come out. And uh, so they can see that I'm I'm working on it. I'm working on the issue. I'm not just blowing them off and just ignoring them. I'm dealing with the issue. They see that uh, I'm working on it. And uh, it may take some time. It may take a few days. But at least they can see that I'm doing something. And they'll give me the benefit of the doubt. If, I was an, if it was an adversarial relationship uh, uh, and I ignored the tenant for a few days with no heat, they could be calling the authorities on me. So I deal with conflicts by communications, uh, have a, a, a customer-oriented mindset. And, uh, you know, I, I do those little things like goodwill gestures, the free vacations, the bouquets of flowers, and all those kinds of things for me to foster a good, positive relation with my tenants. That's how I handle conflicts. Uh, at the end of the day, they deal, they're human beings. And, uh, you know, if you treat them with the respect... Uh, I'm not saying you should be their buddies, but you know you treat them with respect, courtesy, and uh, you know I don't see them as, you know, I got 20 doors or 30 doors. I see these people as human beings, and I think that uh, you know uh, that says a lot. Uh, domestic abuse or safety issues. How do I deal with that? Uh, I know one of my tenants. She had a boyfriend who uh, literally, you know beat her up and so she had to get restraining orders against him and uh and things like that i mean she left because she was trying to get away from him and there's nothing i can do about that obviously uh but i try to uh if i can i don't get into their personal life it's not my business i don't really want to get immersed in their life uh but you know i i can listen i can be respectful i can offer suggestions and, uh, you know, and provide some resources uh, in terms of organizations that they can go to if something happens. So it's all about communications. It's all having that customer service mindset. It's all about trying to minimize turnover. It's all about being a good person, being doing the right thing and building the firewall against other landlords poaching your tenants. Hopefully I answer that question, Tai. Okay, Ejo, what type of license must I have as a property owner to manage my, i.e., process and eviction? If I have a licensed property manager, can that person act on my stead? 
and file the eviction. It depends on what jurisdiction you're in, uh, Ejo, because uh, I know that in the Metro DC area, uh, where I own properties in Washington DC and also suburban Maryland, uh, you requ you're required to have a license before you can evict anybody uh, because you got to put your license information on the eviction forms. So, uh, so I usually, uh, you know, go by, out of my way in Washington, they call that a basic business license, BBL. In other jurisdictions, they call them rental licenses and you got to apply for them. Typically there's paperwork, there's money you have to you know, pay. And there's some level of inspections that take place to make sure that your property is compliant with housing codes and things like that. Ultimately, you should get a license. It's always good to have. You pay your money, and uh, and you know, and, and and that allows you to at least, if you want to, uh, go through the eviction process. Now, in terms of the eviction process, some places it's complicated, some places it's quite straightforward. Uh, I would suggest that you take the time to learn uh, what the process is where you are, and uh, and then you make the decision whether you want to do it yourself or whether you wanna get legal representation to do it for you. Uh, if you have a property manager, then that property manager should hopefully do it on your behalf as well, because that's part of the services that they should be offering you. Um, you know, I've had mixed experiences with property managers. Uh, some of them, well, I've never had, a, I never found a good one, to tell you the truth. Uh, but uh, some of them are good, so I've told. And, uh, but don't build, don't think that all you got to do is just give it to a property management company and all your problems will be solved. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, at least you're going to have to manage the managers. Uh, it's not totally hands off despite what you, you, you know, people lead you to believe it's not. Okay. Good questions today. Also 748. Okay. I got about 10 minutes or so compromised on credit score and had a tenant from hell the tenant broke the one-year lease and only stayed five months is it worth trying to sue the tenants in small claims courts oh my god okay so t uh got let a tenant who had a, co a compromised credit score she was a tenant from hell she broke the terms of a one-year lease and only stayed for five months oh my god Okay, so what should you do? Well, that's screening. Uh, obviously, you picked the wrong person. And uh, I don't know what you did, T, uh, but it certainly sounds like uh, this one's kind of crept in uh, and fooled you and got into your house. Yeah, tenants from a bad tenant, it's, it's a nightmare. It, it really can be very, very frustrating. And uh, that's why I'm so thorough on my screening. I'd rather have a place empty than have the wrong person in my house. It's just not worth the piece, you know, the hassle and the headache and the frustrations. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel you, feel for you. Uh, is it worth suing for the tenant? Depends. Uh, if they have any money, possibly. If you can garnish their wages, most of the time it's not. It's just a waste of time. They don't have any money. And by the time you've uh, you know gone through the legal process, it's it's just a headache. So it may be worthwhile uh if they if you feel it's 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 it, you know you can do it uh sometimes it's just easy just to move on with your life at least you got your property back uh it's even worse if they're in your property and not paying you and they are tenants from hell that's the worst scenario at least you've got your property and now you can move on and get somebody else hopefully uh sorry about that uh rodney i'm interested in learning more about real estate investing i would like to chat about becoming more active in investing yeah. Okay. Shoot me an email, uh, Rodney. I do have an event this Saturday. So it's a very, it's a closed event. It's just for my alumni. Maybe shoot me an email. If anyone wants to come to that event, shoot me an email and I could give you a complimentary. It's free. It's usually for my alumni, people I've done business with, uh, just doing a little freebie. One of my houses that I, uh, I've owned for 10 years in Washington, DC that I'm, I'm going to be selling this house. So I don't normally sell houses, uh, but I'll be doing, I'll be selling this one. Uh, I bought it 10 years ago, had one tenant in there for nine and a half years, the tenants left. And so I'm now deciding to sell the house rather than rent it again, just cash out and so on. So again, I'm gonna do an event there on Saturday, uh, 11 o'clock uh, in Washington DC. If you wanna come, 
uh, shoot me an email and I'll send you an invite. But you, it's not advertised. Uh, no one knows about it uh, except my alumni. So shoot me an email at joe at joeasimo.com. So if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, you want to come on Saturday between 11 and 1, uh, shoot me an email at this email address, joe at joeasimo.com, and I'll send you more information. You can come along. It's free. It's going to be a great event, and you'll see one of my properties in real time. Uh, Saturday between 11 and 1. Uh, let's have a look. What's next? I'm interested in more. Dow 2. Greetings for Phoenix. Hi, Dow 2. Hope you're doing well. Happy birthday a few days early, huh? Yeah, it's my birthday next Wednesday. And I'll be celebrating that in the Caribbean. Yay! Can't wait. Uh, I think it's going to be either it's going to be in Jamaica or it's going to be in the Cayman Islands. One of those two places. Uh, okay. Prekesh. Pinkesh. Uh, congrats on 27 year long term tenant. That's it. Yep. I saw you on BP. You had great suggestions on the show. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 27 years, my longest tenant. It's amazing. On a 15 year mortgage. Can you believe that? Congratulations to Femi. Yep. Congratulations. 6,300 bucks. Yep. That's how much we're getting uh, in this area. Uh, Ty, when you're going through rehabs, how do you maintain the integrity of your properties, theft, etc.? Um, you obviously want to secure the property. You can have a, a alarms if you want to, and uh, obviously you have a lot boxes, and uh, you have contractors who come there regularly. So uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, you want to secure your property, obviously, and um, and uh, and there are things that you can do to secure it. Make sure the doors are locked. Make sure the windows are locked at nighttime. Leave a couple of lights on uh you know be friendly with your neighbors so if they see any hanky panky going on they can give you a call uh so lots of little things that you can do uh and obviously you want to be careful who goes into your property uh, i don't allow strangers to come into my houses um you know just off the street because they could be scoping your property out and uh and so on so uh don't feel that was helpful dolly jones hey dolly uh Hey, Dolly. Wow, I didn't expect to see you, Dolly. <laughs> uh, Dolly is one of my tenants. Wow. Uh, I think so. Oh, gosh. Dolly, hope you're doing well. And uh, what's it? She's been with me. How long have you been with me, Dolly? About six or seven years now. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. The internet oh, sorry. Reachable. Yeah, so she's been with me seven, six and a half years or so. And uh, she said, Mr. Joe is the best landlord. Oh, boy. Thank you, Dolly. Um, Yes. So what's it called? Uh, Dolly's a sweetheart. Uh, we've had our ups and downs. I'm, just, I'm sure you know Dolly, but you have a good heart. And I know you know I have a good heart and we get on very well. well. Uh, she, she, she blasts me out every now and then. I get it. Uh, but we've gone through some good times and bad times, but we stuck in there. And uh, she's a great person and she's got a great heart, a great family and, uh, and so on. So hi, Dolly. Uh, and so on. Let's have a look. Johnny H, congratulations to Femi. Yep. So I'm just, uh, let's have a look. Rodney Green, Gregory, hope you're doing well. And I think that's about it. So it's now about getting on to eight o'clock. Hope, hope today's session was a good one. Uh, I enjoyed it. Hopefully, I shared with you some quality information. And uh, again, if you uh, want to communicate with me, shoot me an email. Uh, you can reach me at uh, joe at joeasimo.com. And if you want to schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me, uh, go to my website and book a, a one-hour session with uh, me through Dr. Joe. Ask Dr. Joe, they call it. And I'll be more than happy to help you out if I can. And I think we are done for the day. So, again, I hope this was a good session. I enjoyed it. Uh, next week, I'll be out of town, out of the country. So, hopefully, I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. And uh, have a safe, wonderful uh yeah, rest of the evening, rest of the week, rest of the month. And I'll check in with you in a couple of weeks in March. Okay, guys, have a good night. Take care. Bye for now.